This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... Value principles are patient first, and we want to deliver the highest quality care. The goal of creating and sustaining value is all about putting the patient at the center of the equation. The purpose of this organization is to help people get back to what they need and love to do. Crude climbs. The Dow closes at a record high for the sixth straight session as OPEC's landmark deal to cut production widens. Art of the oil deal, why the CEO of ExxonMobil with deep ties across the globe is being considered for Secretary of State. Cost and controversy. Donald Trump takes aim at another defense company. This time, it's Lockheed Martin. Those stories and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report. It's Monday, December the 12th. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bill Griffith in for Tyler Matheson tonight. And welcome. Thank you. Good I'm to be here. I'm Sue Herrera. Another record close for the Dow Jones Industrial Average today. But we are going to begin tonight with the widening of OPEC's production deal. Another 11 countries pledged to cut supply. It is the first global pact in 15 years to jointly scale back on output. And Saudi Arabia, the largest exporter of that commodity, says it could reduce supply even further. The decision, in effect, ends the infighting that prevented a production cut and exacerbated the global oversupply of crude. Today, domestic crude hit levels not seen in about a year and a half, rising more than 2.5 percent, extending a rally that has pushed prices up by more than 45 percent over the past year. And the rise in oil prices helped lift energy stocks, including Dow components ExxonMobil and Chevron today. But higher oil prices also increased costs for transportation companies. So sectors like airlines fell today, and that pressured the broader market. Here are the final numbers today. The Dow, the lone gainer among the major averages, gained 39 points, a new record at 19,796. It's 15th record close since the election, but write it down in pencil. The <laughs> Nasdaq dropped by 31 points. The S&P was down, too. As for Exxon and Chevron, they both rose more than 1 percent today. ExxonMobil's CEO is reportedly being considered by Donald Trump for the position of Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson is known as an aggressive deal maker with ties that reach across the globe and into Russia. Jackie DeAngelis has more. Rex Tillerson is used to being in the spotlight in the energy world, but now he's center stage in a whole new way. Recognized as President-elect Trump's top contender for Secretary of State, people want to know more about this oil man. Tillerson's been at the helm of Exxon since 2006, after starting at the company in 1975. He's 64 years old and must retire from the energy giant before March of 2017 when he turns 65. Under Tillerson's leadership, Exxon stock has seen fluctuations in tandem with the global markets and oil prices, but overall, it's higher. But the question now, how a Tillerson-run State Department will impact foreign relations and the energy industry. This weekend, Donald Trump said this about the candidate. Well, in his case, he's much more than a business executive. I mean, he's a world-class player. He's in charge of, I guess, the largest company in the world. As the CEO of ExxonMobil, Tillerson has overseen operations in over 50 countries. While he has no formal diplomatic experience, he has long-lasting relationships with many global leaders. But he's also being scrutinized for his ties to Russia and relationship with Vladimir Putin. Are they too friendly? Some worry the Tillerson mindset, that's to say having an oil CEO in the Trump cabinet, may have a broader impact, even though it presumably could be positive for energy companies. For example, how would he advise the president-elect on Iran, a country with plentiful oil resources, but a regime with policies that present conflicts? There is a lot of uncertainty in the world today, certainly in the big producing regions, the Middle East, the mm -hmm. uh, relationship with Russia, and those are enormously important parts of the world for everyone's economies. I mean, this is, you know, energy is the lifeblood to economic growth. As the country awaits the formal announcement, there's also the expectation that many of these questions will be raised at Tillerson's confirmation hearings. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jackie DeAngelis. 
And as Jackie just uh, mentioned, navigating our relationship with Iran can be tricky, but that did not stop Boeing from entering into what is the biggest U.S. deal with that country in 40 years. It was made possible by last year's landmark nuclear agreement, which President-elect Trump has threatened to undo. Phil LeBeau takes a look at it for us tonight. One week after shares of Boeing went tumbling following a tweet from President-elect Donald Trump about the cost of Air Force One, Boeing's airplanes are once again in the news, this time because of a deal the company announced over the weekend with Iran. This deal is for 80 airplanes to be sold to Iran, market value $16.6 .6 billion, with the first plane to be delivered in 2018. But there are a lot of ifs behind this deal, and a lot of people are wondering if it even happens. First of all, Iran is not financing this deal to the Export-Import Bank, and it leaves open the question, who will finance the deal of these airplanes? Also, you've got GE supplying the engines to Iran worth $3 billion. But will this deal even get approved? Congressional leaders have talked about blocking it, and President-elect Trump is not seen to be favorable towards any kind of a deal with Iran. Back in January of this year, he tweeted out, Iran is going to buy 114 jetliners with a small part of the $150 billion we are giving them, but they won't buy from the U.S., rather Airbus. That would seem to indicate that President-elect Trump would not want Airbus to get the deal, but that's a possibility if this deal is blocked and does not go through. Take a look at shares of Boeing. They have rebounded over the last week following the tweet from President-elect Trump. But again, at this point, what we have is an order from Iran for 80 Boeing airplanes. The question now, will congressional leaders or will President-elect Trump block that deal from going through? Phil LeBeau, Nightly Business Report, New York. By the way, the Boeing 70, uh, 777 is one of the models that Iran is buying. And late today, Boeing said that it's cutting production of that plane starting next year. It also said that it plans to increase its dividend by 30 percent and authorized a new $14 billion stock buyback program. Donald Trump is widening his attack on defense contractors. Today, the president-elect took aim at Lockheed Martin's F-35 fighter jet program, calling the cost, quote, out of control. That sent shares of the company lower by about 2.5 percent. Morgan Brennan takes a look at the controversial fighter jet. Defense stocks got beaten down today as the future leader of the free world again took to Twitter. This time, president-elect Donald Trump targeted Lockheed Martin lambasting the F-35 program for, quote, out-of-control costs and warning that, quote, billions of dollars can and will be saved on military purchases once he takes office. Lockheed Martin responded with a lengthy reply, saying the company understands concerns about affordability and welcomes the opportunity to address any questions the president-elect has about the program. The defense contractor says it has invested millions of dollars to reduce the price of the next generation stealth fighter jet by 60 percent, projecting it will cost $85 million within the next three years. All of this unfolding as Israel welcomed two F-35 planes today, making Israel the first of a handful of U.S. allies that will have the American-made fighter jets in operation. The F-35 is the most expensive weapon system in history with an estimated $400 billion price tag, nearly double the original budget, as engine production issues and software glitches contributed to huge cost overruns. That sum includes more than 2,000 jets for the U.S. government. The 16-year-old program has been the subject of criticism, but finding a realistic replacement may not be possible. From a fifth-generation stealth fighter cap uh, capability standpoint, no, uh, there isn't a... a, a a ready alternative. We could develop an alternative as a nation, but that would take, again, probably decades to field in large numbers. The question would be uh, if you want slightly less capable aircraft that can be had at a lower uh, price point, uh, could you go that direction? Today's tweet is the second to take aim at a defense company in less than one week. Trump previously questioned the cost of Boeing's Air Force One replacement program. It draws into question plans for defense spending, which many have anticipated will increase under the incoming administration, which has three, and potentially more, generals tapped for key cabinet and advisor positions. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. And here to talk more about the so-called Trump effect on the defense sector, Michael Farr is with us tonight, the president of Farr, Miller & Washington. Michael, good evening. 
Good evening. Great to be with you nice guys. Nice to Thank see you. you. Uh, clearly, Donald Trump is looking at military spending the way he looks at uh, spending on his own real estate projects. Do you think that will affect the bottom line of the prime contractors out there? What do you think? I think it's going to depend whether or not he's successful, Bill. I mean, we know that Washington has been anything but functional for a month for a number of years now. So uh, the intention is kind of music to any number of American ears to say, yes, this stuff is so expensive. We've got to start cutting these costs. He's been tweeting about a lot of very expensive things, whether it was the Air Force One plane or the F-35 fighter or whatever, or even drug prices. And all of those industries get to be very volatile. But can he really do it? Will he really do it once Congress gets in session? And how long will it take? Are some significant questions. And at stake is his credibility. But as an investor, Michael, when you see, say, you have Lockheed Martin in your portfolio or, or some of the drug stocks and healthcare stocks that went down the other day, what are you to do? Do you just ride it out and, until he takes office and we get a clearer picture of, as you say, what he can accomplish? Because the right. percentage moves in some of these stocks have been significant. So they've been significant and the volatility continues. You know, we all know that Wall Street hates to be surprised. And this new form of governing by President-elect Trump is, is full of surprises. We don't know which industry or hot topic we're going to hear about next. If it's pro, will the stock go up? If it's con, will the stock fall out? If you're holding some of these, uh, if some of the defense contractors, for instance, I think you have to go to your fundamental investment thesis about the earnings and the balance sheets and make sure you're comfortable holding them through a more volatile period um, to find out what's really going to happen. Uh, but he's covering enough turf here. and uh, Washington is enough of a slow place. He's a proven ma business magnate. He's not a proven president or politician. I think he ought to be really a little more careful about spreading himself too thin as his political agenda hasn't even begun yet. But uh, it would appear that some of the CEOs who that have been hitting his crosshairs are learning how to play this game very quickly. The CEO of Boeing was just saying that this deal with Iran to sell those Boeing jets over there that Mr. Trump doesn't want to happen, he's pointing out, the CEO of Boeing is, that it will create thousands of jobs here in the United States, which should be music to Mr. Trump's ears. Uh, should be, and we're going to find out which of Mr. Trump's political agendas actually takes precedent, won't we? Will it be the creation of jobs? Will it be the cessation of the deal uh, with, with Iran? It's, I mean, the jury is out on all of these things. But I think clearly, you know, we saw that the carrier company is going to keep some jobs in the U.S. and not in Mexico, and they're receiving kudos. But, you know, the CEOs are doing what the stock market does. We, ad we adjust and adapt to these surprises. We've, we've oddly and sadly been able to adjust and adapt to terrorism around the world. It's now kind of computed in, and market returns don't go up or down much on acts of terror. Right. It's, it's sad, but it's true. So uh, the markets will figure this out, and markets will s know how to react to these various uh, tweets as they come out. It's an interesting way to run one's agenda. I, I wonder if he's ever going to have a press conference, Bill, right. or is he just going to tweet from the White House? Well, it's he's really got one scheduled for Thursday, so we'll find out how that goes. That may uh, affect it in the future. Michael Farr of Farr Miller in Washington, thank you. S stick to your balance sheets. Thank you. There you go. <laughs> China today issued its strongest condemnation yet of the president-elect. This after Donald Trump said that the U.S. was not necessarily bound by the One China policy, which recognized Taiwan as part of One China. Many Chinese investors are calling on Mr. Trump to tread carefully, including the head of Dalian Wanda, who has invested more than $10 billion in the U.S. and employs about 20,000 people. Still ahead, out of step, can today's CEOs handle the unique approach of the president-elect? Well, Mr. Trump has made it official. The president-elect has named Goldman Sachs president and chief operating officer Gary Cohn as the director of National Economic Council. In that role, uh, role, Cohn will be one of Mr. Trump's top economic advisors, and he will play an influential role on economic policy and decisions. Boardrooms across the country are on alert. 
for the most part, CEOs have always done things a certain way. But now they have to figure out how to conduct business with a president-elect who has a very different approach. Mike Santoli takes a look. No CEO would ever likely enjoy an incoming president trying to dictate how a business should be run. But the current generation of corporate leaders is perhaps uniquely out of step with President-elect Trump's approach to production, trade, and capital investment. For the most part, today's CEOs are globalists, climbing to the top job by creating global supply chains and pushing to maximize open trade relationships. They've also come of age in an era of constant productivity enhancement aimed at minimizing labor costs. In the current economic expansion, in fact, labor share of the economy has remained depressed compared to the long historical trend. On the financial side, most CEOs have a bias towards sending excess cash to shareholders in the form of share buybacks and dividends, rather than making heavy investments in their business. All of these CEO priorities run counter to Trump's push to have companies make more products in the United States with American workers, his threats of punitive tariffs, and promised incentives to plow cash into new domestic projects. Some corporate consultants liken the challenge for CEOs to the one posed in recent years by activist investors, oh, only based on a different set of demands. As with those professional investors who agitate for shareholder-friendly changes, experts say CEOs need to be ready for a call or a tweet from the next president and should prepare an explanation for corporate strategies in case they find themselves in the hot seat. This at least raises the possibility of more standoffs between companies and the president-elect. On the positive side for CEOs, Trump is a businessman always looking to negotiate a deal, which is a familiar mindset to corporate executives. The promise of a big corporate tax cut would also ease the blow of any uncomfortable scrutiny from the White House. And some argue that CEOs need to be reminded that new investment in their business is one way to grow and create value after so many years of slow growth and focus on cost cutting. In any case, it appears that corporate bosses faced a tougher than usual adjustment to the new administration led by a man with unusually strong views on how they should do their jobs. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Mike Santoli at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, many Silicon Valley CEOs were vocal critics of Donald Trump during the presidential campaign, of course. This week, a number of them are going to make their way to Trump Tower to meet with the president-elect's team as they search for any silver linings. Josh Lipton reports for us tonight from San Francisco. I am not supporting Trump, Donald Trump, and under no circumstances will I support Donald Trump. He wasn't Silicon Valley's choice for president. The high-profile battles between Donald Trump and the tech elite, like Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos, Meg Whitman, and Tim Cook, grabbed the headlines. Most of the folks who raised the big money also opposed him. But now venture capitalists are trying to find the positives in a Trump presidency. They say the first benefit of a Trump win, tax reform. For example, Trump wants to lower the tax rate on cash stashed overseas. And Silicon Valley has a lot of it. That could mean companies like Apple, Microsoft and Cisco bring money back to the U.S. and put it to work here. For a venture capitalist, that's extremely important because the public capital markets have been such a disappointment for so long. It's very difficult to exit except through M&A. Not all of Trump's tax reform is good news for VCs, though. He wants to end preferential tax treatment for carried interests or the profit on the sale of alternative assets, which can include companies. And that could hit venture investors hard. Already, some well-respected VCs are threatening to quit if Trump has his way. Still a Another area where VCs see opportunity, Trump's focus on rolling back regulation. David Golden says he expects to see changes at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, specifically loosening restrictions on consumer lending. That could benefit financial tech startups, a big recipient of venture dollars. The CFPB had focused on a number of areas that were posing uh, great difficulties for venture capitalists that were investing in alternative lending platforms in particular. Um, they had proposed regulations around payday lending, around prepaid debit cards, around installment lending, that at least at least in the case of payday lending, would essentially have eliminated that industry. Trump's team will meet with tech leaders on Wednesday, and the guest list is a who's who, from Apple's Tim Cook to Alphabet's Larry Page and Amazon's Jeff Bezos, all are expected to attend. It should be noted that the meeting was organized by one of the few Silicon Valley Trump supporters, Peter Thiel. Topics to come up include the new administration's stance on immigration, which is a critical issue for the venture industry. 
For Nightly Business Report, I'm Josh Lipton, San Francisco. Sumner Redstone and his daughter Sherry pull the rug out from under a possible merger between Viacom and CBS. And that's where we begin tonight's market focus. National Amusements, the Redstone family holding company, which owns the majority voting stake in Viacom and CBS, said it was not the right time to merge the two media properties. It added it is optimistic about Viacom's future given the recent management changes there. Shares of Viacom tumbled more than 9% to 34.99. CBS shares were down a fraction to 62.18. Chipotle says it will only have one CEO from now on. The burrito chain said co-CEO Monty Moran will step down immediately, leaving founder Steve Ells as the sole CEO. Chipotle says the board of directors wanted Ells to resume leadership given the ongoing challenges facing the company. And following the news, shares rose 3% to 382.48. Pfizer is raising its quarterly dividend almost 7 percent to 32 cents a share, up from 30 cents. The annual yield on the dividend is nearly 4 percent. Shares of the drug maker were up 70 cents to 32.40. Rare disease drug maker Alexian Pharmaceuticals uh, said that its CEO and CFO have resigned. The company says both men have left for personal reasons and to pursue other opportunities. But a source told CNBC the resignations were tied to the board's loss of confidence in those executives. Shares plunged by 12 percent to $115.08. And then there's Optotech. It saw its shares absolutely get crushed today following the release of disappointing drug trial data. The bio company, biotech company said that its drug for treating wet age-related macular degeneration failed to meet its goals during two studies. That stock nearly wiped out today, plunging by 86 percent to down to $5.29. Bill Gates is starting a new billion-dollar fund. Its purpose is to invest in technologies that counteract climate change. The fund, called Breakthrough Energy Ventures, will finance emerging energy companies that can deliver affordable and reliable energy but with zero carbon emissions. Investors in the fund include Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos, Alibaba's executive chairman Jack Ma, Virgin Group founder Richard Branson, and LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman, among others. Coming up, the big challenges that small business owners are facing in locations around Trump Tower. The Supreme Court today upheld the reach of a federal law that prohibits bank fraud. The ruling gives the government more flexibility to prosecute financial crimes. The unanimous opinion means that a person may be guilty of bank fraud, even though he intended to cheat a bank depositor rather than the bank itself. Well, the Wells Fargo fake account scandal may now have spread to Prudential. The insurance company today said that it was suspending distribution of insurance policies through the bank. California regulators are also looking into new allegations made by former Prudential employees who said that Wells Fargo customers were sold low-cost Prudential life insurance policies without their knowledge. President-elect Donald Trump has spent more of his time since the election at his home in Trump Tower in Manhattan. As we've been reporting, the increased security is creating a headache for businesses in that area, including some of the most recognizable retailers in the world. But as Kate Rogers reports, it's also hurting some small mom-and-pop shops. The holiday season is typically busy for Judge Roy Bean Public House in Midtown, but this holiday season has been unlike any other. November, we're down 30 percent. The bar and restaurant is located on West 56th Street, a block away from Trump Tower. And as President-elect Donald Trump makes his transition from billionaire businessman to commander-in-chief, the street is swarmed with police officers and Secret Service agents. My experience is, is that they're, they're keeping the streets open, they're closing them off, there's no rhyme or reason. We don't know what to expect. And the police presence on the corner has just been, you know, it's intimidating. 
Nearby at Italian restaurant Il Tonello, sales are down at least 30 percent since Election Day, with its owners considering a potential move elsewhere in Midtown if things don't improve. They say patrons traveling by car have a harder time getting in, with the street barricaded off Fifth Avenue and a security tower in place. They like to be dropped off and picked up, and they can do that, you know, or if they can, it takes like half an hour, and a lot of the people for lunch especially have one hour max lunch, an hour and a half. So they lose in half an hour, and then they cannot come here. And to a lot of other businesses around here, but I'm just talking for here. But the security measures haven't been all bad news for local businesses. In fact, at Print on 56, it's been busy. It has not affected at all because um, we have a lot of new traffic in the area, which includes the police people. Those are our new customers now. And we also have walking crowds. Back at Judge Roy Bean, Pernaconi's hoping for a pickup in business post inauguration day, but knows there's no guarantee. Well, we're worried about it. It's a bit of unknown right now. We don't know what kind of police presence there's going to be, how much, uh, you know, how much security there's going to be. And we, don't, we just don't want this for the next four years. Pernaconi and his co-owner Derek Walsh say they're in touch with their local councilman and they're currently drafting a petition to the city to ask them to open this street back up to traffic. They say almost two dozen small businesses are set to sign. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kate Rogers in New York City. And that is Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. I'm Bill Griffith. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... Our value principles are patient first, and we want to deliver the highest quality care. The goal of creating and sustaining value is all about putting the patient at the center of the equation. The purpose of this organization is to help people get back to what they need and love to do.